and a will. That's what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. That's it's very clear in Aquinas, very clear in Augustine. He, they take it very much so from Aristotle's thought, etc. Although Aristotle's not going to necessarily use that exact language, but he's going to get close. Um, you do kind of see in the theology of the body some tinkering around with that. So that's, I think, sometimes where some modern Catholics kind of fall into male and female being kind of like certain distinct expressions of the one God in some ambiguous places. That's all, that's all baloney because God doesn't have a body. Um, and there's wait, no what such you thing mean, as what do you a mean by that? Wait, wait, dive into that a little, because I, I, I've always heard like, to me, the theology of the body was uh, it's, it's like phenomenology, right? Like I've never really studied it much, but I've, I've heard tra traditionalists knock it and stuff. And I don't know what the arguments for and against it are. What do you, what did you mean by that? Like wh what's sure, nonsense yeah, about there's... it? So theology of the body, first and foremost, let me preface this and, and unless we have some hardcore JP2 fans out there. What I mean when I say theology of the body, we first have to understand that theology of the body is a series of catechetical talks and lectures by given by Pope John Paul II. These are not, not by any stretch. Some of these things uh, pertain under like legitimate Catholic moral theology. Some of this is his opinion. So we have to kind of go in there with that brush of uh, nuance, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, go in there and uh, and clean up and see if we can figure these things out. When it comes to certain issues, though, theology of the body has, in my personal opinion, this is the opinion of, I would say, most traditionalist style Thomists. And when I say traditional Thomists, I'm not saying like trads. I just mean Thomists who actually know what they're talking about. The problem is that you start to run into um, two main categorical errors. First, the first one is mainly in principles. So in like how we see man made in the image and likeness of God. The second one is in act, um, application. Um, of certain activities let's just put it that way so when it comes to john paul ii's thought on um the creation of man or excuse me not the creation of man but man in the image and likeness of god there seems to be this tendency where he seems very interested in talking about the divine uh, nature that all man possesses now there is a certain way you can of course interpret this correctly because every man who has existed has existence is made in the image and likeness of god but where it starts to get tinkered around with is he starts to fall into this idea that man and woman specifically in our bodies starts to reflect the image and likeness of god now he doesn't just come out and like straight up say like this is exactly but he starts to kind of in the world of phenomenology saying we experience this reality of the difference in the sexes of body you know, is there not so like all all men when when talking about God, even men are almost the female because we receive from God. Right. So a man, when he's with his wife, that coming together in the marital act is the wife receiving the man. So when we receive grace from God, we're almost in a in a feminine role receiving from God, like the seed of God's thought in our in our being. Like I know he, he uses some of that language. Right. Yeah, no, he he does, and um, he gets a lot of it actually from Gaudium et Spes, because Gaudium et Spes actually puts a little bit of uh, that type of language in it, um, and so there there is some confusion there. When it starts to get really off track, in my opinion, is when you start to kind of get into the practical applications of this. So I'm going to try to make this as PG as I can, <laughs> to put it that way. Um, there are certain marital acts that are going to obviously be illicit, and there's going to be certain actions which are going to be illicit. And when you go back, you read St. Alphonsus, you go back and you read old moral theology manuals, there's going to be some very explicit and very, I would argue, just common actions that are done today, a, a mix married couples who probably don't know any better and aren't ill-intentioned that are not going to be um, licit morally. And, I, and I've and i tried to mentally argue these things, but I just don't see a way around this. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain this better. Okay, so if you look to theology of the body, they're basically their thesis is as long as it ends in a procreative act, pretty much everything is okay. As long as the, the final act ends in, in procreation, all bets are off, foreplay is great, fine. Where if you go back to St. Alphonsus, any kind of, um uh i mean we call it sodomy for a reason and i'm not i'm talking oral and and others like saint alphonsus will tell you straight out you cannot do this where yeah. john paul actually makes allusions to like as long as it's not you know as long as the end result is procreative you're okay mm -hmm. and and i know i would disagree with even 
uh, I think like Tim Gordon would fall on the more theology of the body end of that than I would, you know, because I've had conversations with him where I, I, I'm pretty sure he would differ with me on that. Like, look, you don't want to, I don't know. It's, it is a, it is a touchy subject because you don't want to reveal too much, especially for me, I'm a married guy. So anything I say is going to imply what my marriage is like. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, best way to say it is that when you look at it, I think Alphonsus has the upper hand and here's why we're not allowed to put ourselves into, um, or at least we're not allowed to put ourselves into occasions of sin, right? Without a just cause for it, right? So as an example, there can be just circumstances in which we put ourselves into occasion of sin. So technically speaking, the church says that courtship is an occasion of sin, but it's obviously necessary because obviously if there's no courtship, there's no marriage. And if there's yeah. no marriage, there's none us. And then why are we here? Um, but and the occasion what, of sin doesn't mean commit sin. It means mm -hmm. possibility for it. Sure. Yeah. But if there's not a just cause for it, and I don't want to say this to make people scrupulous, right? So weigh your consciences with what I'm about to say, but it is not morally licit to willfully put ourselves into an occasion of sin when there's not a just cause for it. Right. So, as an example, so uh, yes, is, he is a doctor, right? Yeah, yeah, doctor of the church, and he's specifically the doctor in moral theology. And so his argument when it comes to these particular issues is there is very much so a, um, a, a danger of sin because the end action is potentially going to be nipped in the bud, if you will, on not allowing procreative activities to take place. And I and that just makes sense. The only arguments that I've really ever heard in the opposite really just sound like some type of non-theological workaround to try to find an excuse to, to do certain actions. And I've just never been convinced of it. You have to, you have to first start with the objective and it just seems very loosey goosey when you go from there. Yeah. I, I, I saw, uh, I saw my friend Kyle had a couple on that were opening like a Catholic sex shop and stuff. And he caught a lot of grief for that. Heck <laughs> because no. heck, I've not even heard of this, but heck no. Yeah. He had to take the video down because he caught a lot of flack for it. It's like, look, there, you know what? I don't even want to get into all that. So, all right. So let's deal with the second question, which was the problem of evil, right? Mm -hmm. The problem.